Hong Kong brings back many memories for Therese, my wife and I. Uh, we lived here in 1984. Uh, I was a student then at uh, Chinese University of Hong Kong out at uh, Sha Tien, Sha Tien. Uh, and our middle... The, uh, and uh, our, uh, our daughter uh, came here with us as a three-week-old baby. Uh, and our middle son, uh, Nicholas, was born up on the hill here at the Matilda. And so uh, he still has his Hong Kong birth certificate. Uh, he will seek uh, subsequent citizenship application to the People's Republic in due course. Our purpose today, however, is uh, not about Hong Kong. Um, it's not even uh, directly about China, though it is in part. Uh, it's about uh, uh, the future of the nuclear program on the Korean Peninsula and where that takes peace and security more broadly in the region and the world. Um, let me say one or two things as I uh, prepare to invite our two uh, guests uh, to the stage. Uh, let's um, stand back for a moment and reflect on just how rapidly things have moved in three months. Or, underneath the surface, how they may not have moved much at all, despite all the appearance of activity. Three months ago, a little longer, the 28th of November, a date which is probably not first and foremost in people's mind, but it was the date on which uh, the North Koreans tested uh, their ICBM successfully, the Hwasong. They, at that stage, proclaimed the successful completion of their nuclear project. Come the 1st of December, the 1st of January this year, in his New Year's address, Kim Jong-un uh, then proclaimed that he was interested in the opening of a new inter-Korean dialogue and would wish uh, for North Korean p joint participation in the Winter Olympics to be held in South Korea. In the period since then, of course, we have seen the formation of a joint North Korean-South Korean team at the Winter Olympics. None of us can, can forget the North Korean cheerleading squad uh, in their marvellous uh, retro socialist realist form, uh, a combination of karaoke, a combination of uh, uh, K-pop uh, with Korean communist characteristics. Um, it's a unique art form. Uh, seriously weird. Um, and then, since then, uh, and the arrival of uh, Kim Jong-un's uh, sister uh, to the Winter Olympics, uh, in the company of the nonagenarian Kim Yong Sam. Uh, and we've seen a flurry of inter Korean activity uh, leading to uh, the visit to Pyongyang by the South Korean National Security Advisor Chung, um, a very lively dinner uh, that evening hosted by uh, Kim, uh, Kim Jong il, Kim Jong un. If Kim Jong il had hosted it, it would have been less lively. <clears throat> and following that, a return to uh, Seoul by uh, National Security Advisor Chung and immediately travelling on to Washington uh, to brief the uh, Trump administration of the outcome, including um, in National Security Advisor Chung's rendition of the conversation in Pyongyang, an invitation uh, to... Uh, the United States uh, for there to be a, a bilateral summit between the North Korean leader and President Trump. I think what surprised the entire world, including the North South Korean National Security Advisor Chung, was President Trump's immediate decision to say yes. And then we saw a further flurry of activity. Um, uh, this caught the South Koreans by surprise. It certainly caught the North Koreans by surprise. It caught the Chinese by surprise. It caught the rest of the US administration by surprise. And it caught me by surprise as well, the last in that long queue. Uh, 
And then the debate has gone on to focus as to would this summit actually proceed? Would there be preconditions associated to the notion of denuclearization? Um, and when would it proceed? And where would it proceed? I think it's fair to say our Chinese friends uh, were not entirely amused uh, by this being unilaterally announced without prior consultation with them. Um, and certainly in our own private discussions with uh, the Chinese uh, government, uh, it's been plain uh, that there has been somewhat of a breakdown in Chinese-American diplomatic communication over that particular uh, event. In the meantime, uh, we've seen the events of just the last few days. Um, I have just come from Beijing, uh, attending the China Development Forum, where I was speaking on the Belt and Road Initiative, among other things, including the current uh, status of uh, US-China trade relations. Um, perhaps the first sign that something unusual is happening in Beijing when all of us who were delegates to the China Development Forum at uh, the Diao Tai State Guest House got kicked out at 3 p.m., on Monday afternoon. Um, this was not consistent with normal, polite Chinese practice. Uh, none of us, however, concluded that there was a more important guest about to arrive by train. Um, uh, and of course, uh, by the time we got to that evening on Monday night, I was actually doing an interview with CNN on Monday night with Christian Amanpour uh, and Deputy National Security Advisor, formerly uh, Jeffrey from the United States. Um, and when the rumours were f flowing hard and fast in Beijing that something unusual was happening with an unexpected guest arriving by train, uh, that tends to reduce the possibilities down a little. Uh, it was unlikely to be uh, Vladimir Putin. It was uh, likely to be someone closer at hand. Uh, and so you've seen this morning the confirmation finally uh, through the Chinese official media that this indeed was a visit uh, by... Uh, Kim Jong-un, his first meeting with Xi Jinping uh, and his first visit uh, to the People's Republic uh, since becoming uh, the General Secretary of the Korean Workers' Party uh, five years ago. In fact, his first visit outside the borders of the DPRK in five years since taking office. And this brings us to this morning. Uh, I'm glad uh, China and the foreign ministry acceded to my request to postpone the confirmation of Kim Jong-un's uh, visit until this morning, just to set the stage for our gathering here uh, in, uh, in Hong Kong at lunchtime today. Uh, that was a joke, in case anyone doesn't understand. <laughs> Irony. Um, but it does set the stage for where we are. And uh, as I uh, go on to introduce our two guests... Let me just quote to you from the joint uh, statement, or shall I say Xinhua account, of the comments made by Kim Jong-un and Xi Jinping uh, at the welcoming banquet at the Great Hall of the Pe People uh, for the visiting North Korean delegation. Uh, comrade Xi Jinping uh, said that we speak highly of this visit. He said, both uh, Comrade Chairman uh, Kim Jong-un and I have personally experienced and witnessed the development of the China DPRK relationship, adding that both sides have stated repeatedly that traditional Chinese DPRK friendship should be passed on continuously and developed better. That leaves to one side what's happened for the last five years when there hasn't been so much continuity. In fact, a war of words between the two of them. Xi Jinping continues... This is a strategic choice and the only right choice both sides have made based on history and reality, the international and regional structure and the general situation of China DPRK ties. This should not and will not change because of any singular particular event at any particular time, unquote. I think that's Xi Jinping being quite plain about the fact of let's let bygones be bygones and get on with the future. Kim Jong-il's response, not Kim Jong-il, Kim Jong-un's response, uh, was uh, equally interesting. Kim said, Comrade Xi Jinping enjoyed the support of the Chinese Communist Party and people of the whole country. He's become the core of the leadership and was re-elected Chinese President and Central Military Commission Chairman. Kim Jong-un said it is his obligation personally to come to congratulate Xi Jinping 
in person, in line with the friendly tradition of DPRK-China relations. He went on to say, at present, the Korean Peninsula situation is developing rapidly and important changes have taken place. He's given to understatement, Kim Jong-un. Adding that he felt he should come in time to inform Comrade General Secretary Xi Jinping personally of the situation out of comradeship and moral responsibility. So there are the formal statements from both sides. Um, we'll now discuss what all that actually means uh, beyond, let's call it, the uh, particular formalities of socialist realist language uh, engaged in by both sides on an interesting formal occasion such as that which has just been held in the Great Hall of the People. I can think of two no better discussants for this and two better contributors and two better panellists and two better experts uh, than our friend, our dear friend and colleague, uh, the former uh, Foreign Minister of uh, the Republic of Korea, uh, Yoon byung se uh, and the former Assistant Secretary of State of the US, uh, Danny Russell. Um, former Foreign Minister uh, Yoon has been an extraordinary contributor to the diplomacy of the ROK over 40 years. Professional diplomat, served in most significant capitals of the world, um, and has previously served as Deputy National Security Advisor to the President of the ROK, Senior Coordinator of the National Security Council of the ROK, and has served for four and a half years as Foreign Minister of the ROK until the recent change in government in Seoul. He is uh, South Korea's second longest serving foreign minister. And a person who has been upfront, close and personal with all the ebbs and flows of the North Korean question relationship, including the nuclear dimension, over many, many years. So we're very grateful uh, to have you with us today, byung se You are a welcome guest with us. Uh, joining him, of course, is Danny Russell, who has been our diplomat in residence uh, at the Asia Society Policy Institute for the last 12 months. Uh, Danny also is an extraordinarily experienced American career diplomat, uh, served in the region uh, and an, has also served in the White House uh, and in that capacity uh, served as Special Assistant to President Obama uh, and the National Security Council Senior Director for Asian Affairs and most recently as Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia in the State Department. Therefore, with core line responsibility for the Korean question, the North Korean nuclear program included. So I can think of no two no better persons to be with us. So ladies and gentlemen, could you please welcome these two individuals as they come to the stage? So thank you very much. I gather you two, by the way, began your uh, uh, personal slash professional relationship when you were both assigned to your respective national missions to the UN. Um, we, did you drink a lot in those days? We, wor we worked a lot in those days. Uh, the difference is that Foreign Minister Yun kept working and I started drinking. Okay. That's when Danny started han hanging out with the Australian mission instead. Uh, but um, give us a word or two about what you two worked on in those days, because I think it's of significance in terms of our discussion today. But actually, at the time, uh, uh, South Korea was not a member of the uh, United Nations, despite that we joined the, uh, we, uh, despite uh, the fact that we were became the independent country in, in 1948. Uh, so our main task is to how to achieve this simultaneous admission of two Koreas, South and North Korea, at the time. Uh, Danny was great, uh, very much contribu has much contributed to his uh, historical achievements. So since that time, we worked on together. We have worked on on these important issues together for the last uh, twenty something years. So that goes on. I should add there was another brilliant diplomat serving at the UN at that time, uh, and her name is uh, Ambassador Chan Hang Chi, who was the permanent representative of Singapore. And. Uh, uh, Heng Chi, were these two guys well behaved when you were there? <coughs> you, you asked the Singaporeans, I'll give you a very candid answer, and uh, Heng Chi's response was, Danny was well behaved, he doesn't know about you. Uh, it's okay. <laughs> Let's uh, talk about uh, the subject at hand. Uh, and that's uh, how do we make sense of this extraordinary 
cacophony of events over the last three months. Uh, let me start with Danny, um, because uh, you've been dealing from a US perspective uh, with uh, the peninsula for such a long period of time. How do we best historically frame what's unfolded uh, since the events of the 28th of November? Well, Kevin, you correctly pointed out a series of, of surprise moves by the North Koreans uh, and by others. But there's an important distinction to be made, I think, between strategic surprise and tactical surprise. So, you know, if anyone who's been to Macau knows that the House is going to win. So if you take your life savings to the uh, gaming tables, sooner or later, uh, they'll be reduced. That's not a uh, surprise. That's a strategic inevitability. The tactical surprise may be losing all your money on the first roll of the roulette wheel. So in a similar vein, uh, while there is a tactical surprise to the abrupt and dramatic timing of some of North Korea's moves, uh, certainly the spate of missile launches and the thermonuclear test, the uh, abrupt pivot on January 1st to a peace offensive. On a strategic level, it's really not a surprise because this, this is replicating a pattern that we've seen again and again. Basically, North Korea has two speeds. Uh, it, it cycles or toggles between uh, them. One is raising tensions. The other is raising expectations. North Korea will scare the world and then dangle some hint of maybe an opportunity to de-escalate and to try to parlay that de-escalation, uh, that reduction of tensions, leverage it into some sort of benefit, usually uh, testing or actually extracting uh, concessions. And when they satisfy themselves that the world isn't going to pay them any more just to back away from threats, well, then they revert to the first escalatory cycle. So it's, it's a, an ongoing uh, alternation between the, the tensions on the one hand and the hopes on the other. That's kind of their business model. I think for our part in dealing with North Korea, uh, the challenge is and remains uh, not to get trapped in that cycle, not to get so uh, frightened or intimidated on the upswing or so relieved uh, on the downswing uh, that we lose sight of what our real interests are and what our real objectives are. And in terms of our own cycle, on, the one, si on one side of the equation is cynicism. It's easy uh, to be skeptical and suspicious of a authoritarian state like North Korea that has a troubled relationship with the truth. Uh, on the other hand, is naivete. Uh, so we neither want to be so cynical in dealing with North Korea that we miss what could prove to be an opportunity to get some kind of peaceful negotiating process underway nor do we want to be so naive that we simply fall into the kinds of traps that uh, are written out pretty clearly in the Kim family playbook. That's a very useful, uh, sobering um, framing of the discussion. I liked your use of the word toggling. because um, Move it one way, move it the other. These are tactical moves within a strategic frame, and the strategic frame being no substantive movement at all on the question of the irremovability uh, of the North Korean nuclear capability. But tempered with, as you rightly said, those of us who watch these things for so long perhaps become blinded to whether there is the possibility of some shift which we don't quite see. Very good framing. I would add, Kevin, that in the seminal uh, New Year's Day statement that you referenced, uh, which is among the cognoscenti at least known as the big button speech. That's the speech in which Kim Jong-un made the point that he's got a big nuclear button right on his desk and he knows how to use it. Uh, that got the attention. Someone else said they had a bigger button. So I'm told. Yeah, yeah. 
But the interesting thing about that speech is that it represents uh, two sides of the equation. On the one hand, uh, in this speech, Kim, Kim Jong-un says, uh, this is our nuclear shield and sword. It will never be removed. No power on earth can take away our, uh, our nuclear capability. Uh, in the same speech, he talks not only about the importance of reconciliation on the Korean Peninsula and the prospect of a joint uh, Olympic team, but at length about the North Korean economy. And these are the two sides of the equation. Kim Jong-un's strategy is to have his cake and eat it too, to retain uh, the illegally acquired nuclear and ballistic missile weapon capability that he developed in defiance of UN Security Council resolutions, and also to extract economic assistance, sanctions relief, and the benefits of legitimate membership in the international community. He wants both. The challenge for the rest of the world is whether we can design a dynamic in which uh, one is traded for the other, namely that uh, North Korea can obtain the security and the economic benefits that it seeks in exchange for peacefully uh, relinquishing its nuclear and missile program. So let's freeze that thought for when we come back to our open dialogue in a minute after I've uh, asked byung Se for his opening remarks. But the key question is, in my mind, as someone who studies Beijing, is what will the Chinese be prepared to allow him to get away with? Having his cake and eating it too? Or just having his cake? Um, let's come back to that, because I think that's a key question. Um, byung Se, your initial reflections on where we've got to as someone who's been in the hot seat and knows better than any of us uh, the reality being faced now by South Korean negotiators and the folks that you have on the other side of the table. Uh, thank you, Kevin, uh, for your kind remarks at the outset, and also thank you for President Shiran and members of the Asian Society uh, for giving me this uh, great opportunity. I think uh, this meeting, uh, this forum is very timely for reasons we know very well. Huh? And uh, this uh, surprising visit uh, by a young leader of North Korea uh, drawing our attention. Actually, uh, uh, as uh, Kevin uh, covered uh, very uh, succinctly, since April, since August uh, last year, until at least uh, the late uh, last year, we have been talking about uh, war clouds some people in the United States talked about 50 to 50, 15 to 50% of the chances of war on the Korean Peninsula. And uh, you know, yeah, there are famous talks about fire and fury, total destruction, and many other things coming from the President Trump. And in the same way, the United, the North Korea has never stopped uh, making very harsh statements. But suddenly, since uh, uh, New Year's message early this year, we are witnessing totally different developments. Now, uh, as Kevin uh, very succinctly summarized, we are uh, talking about, we are hearing a proliferation of uh, summits. Uh, for example, uh, in the uh, forthcoming two months, we are supposed to have at least five summits. Uh, later next month, uh, we are having, we are supposed to have inter-Korean summit. Then uh, maybe sometime in May, uh, U.S. North Korea summit. In between, probably uh, South Korea U.S. summit. And before the uh, U.S. DPRK summit, probably uh, South Korea, Japan, and China summit. And even now, there are talks. Uh, uh, the, the, about the possibility of having trilateral uh, summit uh, among South Korea, U.S., and North Korea. Then, uh, all this week, uh, we had another element, that is North Korea-China summit. So, this represents this uh, multiple, uh, the, uh, um, the multi, multi factor equation character of this North Korean conundrum. Actually, why? What led to this uh, uh, interesting development? 
What's the reason behind this? Uh, for North Korea, for Kim Jong-un, uh, I think this uh, reflects uh, both desperation and uh, the, uh, uh, the, his own uh, confidence. Uh, desperation, uh, I mean that uh, for the last three years, international community has been successful in mobilizing uh, the uh, very strong consensus to sanction North Korea's uh, uh, the bad behavior. So we adopted a lot of resolutions. That is the, the uh, that has been the uh, has been the strongest ever unprecedented uh, the sanctions, and that hurts North Korea severely. Uh, many experts who are talking about have been uh, have said that uh, North Korea may not survive for another year due to these uh, uh, severe sanctions. Another reason, maybe more important reason, uh, seems to be that uh, uh, this uh, North Korean leader. Uh, must have been very concerned about the possibility of uh, U.S. Uh, military strike and uh, the well-known uh, bloody nose operation or bloody nose uh, strategy uh, seems to have made a kind of very important impact on the mindset of the North Korean government. But on the other hand, uh, this represents kind of confidence on his part. As Kevin and uh, Danny has uh, uh, explained very well, since uh, he made a successful uh, test of ICBM, Hwasong-15. He, uh, he may have anticipated uh, this kind of a new kind of roadmap, starting from New Year's message. Because in that message, he already contained very important elements. That is, grand proposal for uh, improving inter-Korean relations. So on the basis of that roadmap, what uh, we see the uh, latest ongoing developments. And uh, this also enhances his image and the stature. The only, the, the picture, you have, you have to simply uh, the imagine the picture to be taken at the summit uh, involving uh, President Trump and also Mr. Kim Jong-un. That simple picture or footage will be sufficient enough to show his people that Kim Jong-un is now an international leader as a normal state, not a rogue state. So this is very interesting development. But anyhow, now we know how this decision has been made, roughly, but the die has been cast. Uh, this is the time for our real actors to uh, engage in uh, very serious preparations. But still, uh, there are both negative and uh, positive, uh, you know, expectation. Positive hopes, expectations and hopes are that probably there could be some, a peace momentum that will continue. Probably there will be more exchange of uh, uh, dialogue of people between South and North Korea. At least uh, many people in Korea, South Korea, are relieved uh, to see the easing of tensions but on the other hand, uh, there, are, there has been a growing concern, not just in South Korea and the United States. Uh, because, as Kevin uh, rightly said, this is only a facade. Optics why is very good. But there has been no evidence that North Korea has really changed its game plan. Uh, rather, uh, we have to ask ourselves several key questions first. One small question has been answered yesterday. Uh, through this uh, statement in Beijing. At least he confirmed the indirect message he sent through South Korean Space Envoy. This is the will of his father and grandfather. And then uh, he is committed to denuclearization. But another big uh, question we have to ask is whether this represents a strategic decision or choice, as mentioned by uh, Kevin at the outset, or tactical decision, or uh, in a positive way, another kind of disguised peace offensive. They are very used to this. Uh, we have to see. Uh, uh, this uh, could go in either way. So on my part, I is to emphasize two big uh, aspects 
in approaching uh, these summit, especially U.S. North Korea summit, because uh, for the inter-Korean talks, I guess that will be a. Uh, I think uh, that uh, that both sides will be very much uh, satisfied with uh, the outcome, even though uh, this time uh, South Korean government uh, plans to raise this uh, uh, nuclear issue uh, more intensively. Uh, before, uh, actually, there was no real uh, opportunity for South Korean government to raise this issue. Uh, so the key question is, the denuclearization issue should be at the forefront of any discussion during the inter-Korean talks and U.S.-North Korea talks. And the key point is that uh, actually, uh, but very famous language, CVID, complete, verifiable, and irreversible dismantlement of North Korean nuclear weapons. Uh, now, North Korea is now talking about preconditions. For them, denuclearization means not just denuclearization of North Korea. It, is, it applies to the entire Korean Peninsula, even the region as a whole, even uh, for the world as well. But when they announced a uh, very important uh, the, uh, proposal two years ago, uh, they listed five preconditions for denuclearization. Most of them are non-status to the United States, including the withdrawal of the United States forces in Korea. There has been, there has been no uh, evidence that they have changed this position. And now, according to this uh, Xinhua Net statement, now they tend to characterize the forthcoming talks as peace talks, not as the nuclearization talks. So, so the key question, another key question we have to uh, ask ourselves is that uh, we have to let, uh, learn a lesson from the past. That means we failed already four times in the past because verification was not that comprehensive, was not very subtle. So. Our catchy phrase should be distrust, therefore uh, uh, verify. Otherwise, uh, there, are, there will be uh, many loopholes to take place, even though we are, we are going to have a very good uh, uh, outcome. But until uh, uh, everything is finished, nothing is finished. And uh, John F. Kennedy said, uh, let's not uh, the uh, uh, be afraid of uh, uh, the negotiation out of fear. Uh, let's uh, fear not to negotiate. So this time uh, we have to prepare uh, for this summit uh, with all the expertise and wisdom. Thank you. Good. Well, thank you for that introduction as well and, uh, and the background that you have brought to bear uh, on the essential question of denuclearization and its verification. What I'm proposing to do in the next 15 and 20 minutes is to run through six or seven questions, four or five. And I thought the best way to do this was perhaps let's go to each element of the strategic equation. Uh, that is the bottom line as we see it going into this period ahead in Pyongyang, uh, what we think their strategy is, what their tactics are, what they think they can get away with. Uh, I'm then going to go on to the question of what's the perspective from Seoul right now on the same questions. What do they believe is achievable out of this round of diplomacy? And then on to Beijing and the US. Uh, and let's see where we wind up by about that time. And to put both of you on some notice, if you're in the positions of responsibility now against the denuclearization option, what would you do? Uh, given the realities we face. So let's just start, and I know we've talked a lot already about what the D DPRK strategy and tactics are, but if I could just focus you, Danny, on the two relevant phrases in the, uh, uh, the Xinhua summary coming out of Beijing this morning, uh, where Kim uh, Jong-un is quoted as saying, it is our consistent stand to be committed to denuclearization on the peninsula in accordance with the will of the late President Kim Il-sung and the late General Secretary Kim Jong-il, he said. 
Then he goes on to say, the issue of denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula can be resolved, comma, if, underline, my underlining, not his, uh, South Korea and the United States respond to our efforts with goodwill, if they create an atmosphere of peace and stability, then third, while taking progressive and synchronous measures for the realisation of peace, unquote. Now, is all that just diplomatic gobbledygook, uh, or does it actually mean something? Uh, Danny, over to you, and then I'll flip to you again, if that's okay, Foreign Minister. Well, the words, Kevin, sometimes change in the North Korean lexicon, but what doesn't change is the, uh, the vagueness and the elasticity of the, uh, the thresholds, the hurdles that they set out. So uh, typically the North Koreans who, by the way, have asked, as far as I know, every president of the United States, uh, certainly since Bill Clinton, uh, for a direct leaders summit, uh, have always said that uh, the United States needs to show sincerity uh, and its hostile policy, uh, create a positive uh, and peaceful atmosphere, uh, take uh, proactive or constructive measures. But they get to define when enough is enough and what that means. Typically, in practice, in the course of actual negotiations, uh, hostile policies, uh, which are not explicitly mentioned at least in, by Xinhua, but are very much at the heart of the North Korean uh, message, means the presence on South Korean soil of uh, U.S. forces. It means the existence of a U.S. ROK defense alliance. Uh, it means uh, the U.S. forces' presence on Japan and the alliance collaboration with Australia. And it also means you looked at me funny. and. In doing so, uh, the United States, according to North Korea, has violated the terms of any agreement and has justified uh, its own uh, extraordinary measures, and those often are simply welching on a deal, uh, cheating on an agreement. It's a misnomer to think that uh, North Korea refuses to negotiate. North Korea is perfectly happy to negotiate. They will only negotiate, however, the things they want. They won't negotiate on the things that they don't want. So they'd be happy to negotiate the withdrawal of US forces and the capitulation of the Republic of Korea. Uh, they've said again and again, notwithstanding denuclearization being the long held cherished dream of Kim Il-sung, that there is no force on earth that will cause North Korea to relinquish its sacred sword and shield, its nuclear weapons. And in a Leninist system, when two utterly contradictory uh, principles coexist, it's the leader who gets to decide uh, which one ultimately matters. That doesn't sound entirely encouraging. Um, <laughs> Foreign Minister, the baseline uh, from uh, Pyongyang, what do they think they can get out of this period of diplomacy? Well, uh, before I directly respond to that, I think uh, Kim Jong-un's game plan seems to be uh, to kill five or six birds with one stone. In Korea, there, there is a saying in, I mean, kill two birds with one stone. They want to kill the bird, five birds at least, South Korea, the US, now China, Japan, and many others. Maybe Australia, I think. Uh, I think uh, they chose very weak link in this uh, multilateral regional uh, you know, equation, starting from South Korea. And then uh, that impacted the President Trump's decision. But on China, uh, Kim Jong-un seems to be taking a page out of his father's playbook in 2000. In 2000, in May, before the Kim Jong-il uh, 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 had a, a planned inter-Korean summit, he suddenly made a visit to Beijing. I think uh, uh, this seems to be uh, the current, the ongoing uh, development seems to be very similar uh, to the previous development. And then uh, uh, regarding this uh, Kevin's uh, question, actually for the last uh, 20 something years, who moves first has been the key question in this, especially since the inauguration of uh, President Trump's, actually, the U.S. government wants North Korea to move first. But if you 
uh, read this statement by Shina Net. The same thing stays here. North Korea wants the United States to move first. In this statement, at least three conditions, three ifs. If you read the statement made by South Korean Space Envoy to Pyongyang, there are two big preconditions. First big precondition is U.S. should uh, uh, eliminate military threat to North Korea. That's a big uh, precondition. Another big precondition is that uh, U.S. should provide uh, security assurance or regime uh, stability assurance to North Korea. But that is equivalent to five preconditions for denuclearization I have mentioned already to move first with this uh, peaceful gesture North Korea wants. That seems to be uh, very difficult for us to imagine. And uh, basically, uh, they are bottom plan, bottom line, or maybe uh, opening position seems to be to get a relief from international sanctions because it's very tough. Uh, except oil, everything is not prohibited. But uh, at the end of the, uh, the uh, road, they, may, they will uh, demand the peace treaty or peace agreement with the United States. Already, as I said at the outset, they characterize these forthcoming talks as peace talks, especially since 2015. They are working very hard on this peace talks issue behind the scenes, making some suggestions to the American colleagues at the uh, uh, Track 1.5 or Track 2 uh, meetings. So, uh, together with this uh, Chinese proposal for parallel negotiation, the denuclearization negotiation, and peace talk negotiation. I think, uh, I guess that uh, they had discussion on this matter as well, this time, early this week. Uh, so, uh, you have to be very careful and cautious about this, because intrinsically, peace talks was not an integral part of this denuclearization uh, discussion. It was a separate discussion, separate track. But now, uh, North Korea and China seems to be uh, trying to integrate this separate issue uh, as a part of this integral uh, nuclear uh, problems. So bottom line seems to be that uh, they want the bottom line to at least both sides should move simultaneously. That impression, that uh, stance was uh, reflected in this synchro synchronized mm -hmm. step, I think. Uh, that. Uh, is the intention of North Korea, I guess. The, um, this is I moved now to the question of how it's seen from Seoul and how Seoul will play this. I mean, uh, I've been to North Korea a couple of times and I've escaped on both occasions. Um, but I've always uh, found our North Korean uh, friends to be just brutally pragmatic about everything. And when they approach this, pardon me if I'm wrong, but I get the impression that their absolute de minima expectation and hope is we simply kick the can down the road for another year or so and take the pressure off the looming, shall I say, uh, military atmosphere in Washington, as they would describe it, even though it may not be a majority view within the administration about the wisdom or otherwise of a bloody-nosed strike. And that if there's a second sort of baseline North Korean interest is just maybe if we shake this tree hard enough, with enough diplomacy, we may get some partial relief on sanctions. And thirdly, if something else mysteriously appears, well, let's let's evaluate that when the time comes. But um, I tend to agree with my two colleagues here, though they're closer to this than I am, that we all have very minimalist expectations in terms of what the North Koreans see as being doable. So let's flip the to the other side of the parallel. We're in your hometown, Seoul. Are you? Is your home, hometown Seoul? Yes. Good. Okay. Not everyone from Korea is from Seoul. I just thought I should ask. Um, and many other beautiful places in city apart uh, in Korea apart from Seoul. Um, but if you're in the position in the Blue House right now, and I'll I'll flip to you first, Foreign Minister, on this question, um, and you're dealing with these realities. Um, what is uh, the South Korean bottom line here? What do you hope to get out of this? Uh, institutionally, your system knows what the North Koreans are like. You've seen um, four times that all this happened before in cycles of toggle forward and toggle backwards. Um, 
President Moon's riding high, I think, in the domestic opinion polls. Um, even his and National Security Advisor Chung's expectations were exceeded, some would say frighteningly so, when he went to Washington and President Trump said, yes, I'll see the guy anytime uh, he wants. Um, rocket man meets rocket man. The, uh, if you were now in the Blue House, um, what would be your advice? Well, I, I fully uh, uh, understand the dilemma faced by my uh, South Korean government, uh, my colleagues at the Blue House as well. Uh, actually, President Moon once said uh, some months ago that uh, this is the biggest uh, security threat challenge in Korean history since, 1940, uh, since the end of the Korean War. But now he calls this ongoing development a miraculous opportunity through which we can uh, achieve peace, permanent peace, and uh, resolve uh, many uh, things at once and, and once and for all. But he also likens this current situation to working on a very fragile glass. Uh, for me, uh, I wish to liken that, that to uh, working over minefields. There are so many mine, mines uh, on, in this field. Uh, so for now, uh, the uh, uh, South Korean government uh, uh, is now intensively engaged in what they call brokering diplomacy. Uh, even though we are allies, uh, we are allies with, ally in alliance relations with uh, Washington, uh, this time, uh, South Korean government uh, seems to be uh, make every effort to uh, the maintain this current uh, peace momentum. Uh, the problem is, this time, unlike the previous two summits, unless we raise this nuclear issue very seriously as an agenda, then there will be no uh, meaningful progress in the forthcoming and the following talks, especially U.S. North Korea talks. So this is the dilemma. If uh, South Korean government uh, push ahead with this nuclear issues very, very, very heavily, then uh, North Korea leader may not be happy because at least this, these preconditions should be met by Washington first. So how to reconcile, how to strike a fine balance between uh, these widening uh, differences uh, in Washington and uh, Pyongyang? That is the uh, key challenge faced by uh, the the uh, uh, Blue House and the uh, South Korean government. But uh, nevertheless, uh, I really wish that uh, they could exercise their diplomatic skills uh, to make uh, some kind of uh, uh, breakthrough or at least the progress in these uh, uh, important uh, daunting uh, challenges. Danny, the bottom line from Seoul, how do you read it? Well, Kevin, I think the greatest strategic asset that uh, any of the five parties around North Korea have, certainly the U.S., uh, South Korea, Japan, and China, is unity. And to the extent that we are unified together, cooperating, communicating effectively, uh, we present a united front and a powerful uh, force of pressure uh, towards the DPRK, and we can get them uh, to do things that they don't want to do which is not an easy proposition. Conversely, North Korea's game is divide and conquer. And uh, Foreign Minister Yun used the phrase weak, weakest link in the chain. Uh, it was clear that Kim Jong-un saw the priority that the South Korean government places on having a secure and a successful Olympic as an opening, as an opportunity, and uh, I think he made use of it. For the North Koreans to sow divisions between Washington and Seoul, and Tokyo and Beijing, is to gain desperately needed breathing space. And I think, from the, uh, I think for each of the parties, the obviously the greatest nightmare is a nuclear war. But the second, uh, everybody's second worst nightmare, is that the other guy has a direct dialogue and makes a separate deal with North Korea, leaving you and your own national interests out in the cold. It was clear, you'll, I'm sure you'll get to China, but it was clear from the Chinese reaction to the uh, announcement on the steps of the White House about a Trump-Kim uh, summit that 
uh, they were, shall we say, conflicted uh, about that. Uh, so I think from the perspective of any of the allied capitals, but from uh, Beijing as well, uh, the risk that one party is going to move independently and without due regard for the collective uh, interests is a very serious concern. Pyeongsang? Actually, Danny mentioned uh, the importance of unity uh, between the uh, two allies and also among uh, five parties. Actually, if you read uh, the Korean newspapers this morning, uh, some conservative newspapers uh, the emphasize the need for China to stick to the implementation of the, uh, their sanctions measures because for the last two years, China played a very important role in making or forcing North Korea to come this far. So if they change their stance and they eased sanctions on North Korea, then that could be the starting point for easing of or maybe the, uh, the weakening of the international sanctions regime. So we have to, the key principle we have to maintain is to stick to the sanctions, maintain the sanctions to the end of the, uh, the vision we have the objective we have, that is, final dismantlement of North Korea nuclear weapons. As you may know, as you know already, uh, I'll not uh, give my uh, estimate on how many nuclear weapons they have, but already experts like uh, Dr. Hacker or Dr. Albright uh, are saying that uh, they have nuclear weapons between 15 and 35, between 20 and 40. Even Defense Intelligence Agency of the United States, leak, according to leaked documents, they are talking about the 60 nuclear weapons. That is almost half of a South, South Asian country. So North Korea has been benchmarking that South Asian country, and uh, that is more than enough their second strike capability. We are already within the range of South Korea and Japan, are already within the range of their nuclear missiles, but now it can reach not just uh, Seoul and Tokyo, but also Guam and Hawaii and Washington this already due to this successful launch of Fasong 15 late November last year. And uh, as Dr. NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg has mentioned uh, two months ago, now Pyongyang is much closer, to, much closer to Munich than to Washington, D.C. So Munich, Singapore, even Canberra uh, could be target of these North Korean nuclear weapons. The um Sobering remarks indeed. The, um, as we move um, the geographical dial towards Beijing, um, when I was last in uh, Seoul in December, I went and saw uh, National Security Advisor Chung in the Blue House, and we spent quite a bit of time about what was then the uh, impending visit uh, to uh, Beijing by President Moon. Um, and uh, when we look at Chinese diplomacy right now, and what has just been pulled off uh, with the uh, visit to uh, Beijing uh, by uh, Kim Jong-un. It raises the question you've just touched on about where does Chinese strategy and tactics go to from here? Um, and uh, does it mean that uh, China's substantive policy remains denuclearization of the peninsula? Uh, as is reflected in the early statements this morning from Xi Jinping? Um, or is there something less than that than our Chinese friends are willing to tolerate in terms of an outcome? So uh, let's uh, reflect on uh, strategy and tactics uh, from Beijing's perspective. I'll add one thought and then flip it to Danny and then back to you, Foreign Minister. Um, uh, on the tactics, um, I think the Chinese play in the last uh, 48 hours has been uh, quite brilliant. Um, China was left out in the cold by the unilateral decision by President Trump to agree to an oral request for a summit with Kim Jong-un and made that agreement without any preconditions and as we discover, without consultation with anybody much. So this did not amuse Beijing. Uh, I've had that confirmed at multiple levels in multiple places. Um, 
And if there is one thing that people don't want to have happen to them, it's to be excluded from the table. Uh, and so China, uh, over the intervening uh, few weeks, has been hard at work. On the precise mechanics we're unfamiliar with. Uh, but the results we now see in terms of the events of the last couple of uh, days, uh, when for the first time in five years, and the first time in his uh, term in office, Kim Jong-un travels to Beijing. So at de minima, on the question of tactics, China is saying to the United States and the rest of the world, anyone wants a deal on anything on the future of the Korean Peninsula, and certainly something which deals with nukes, don't think you can walk around us, guys. Has everyone got that message? That's, that's kind of the bottom line here. Um, and I think that's been delivered eloquently. That is a question of tactics. But on strategy, as well as tactics, uh, Danny, over to you. You've been dealing with our Chinese friends on Korea for longer than me, and then to you, Foreign Minister. Well, China has eminently legitimate interests on the Korean Peninsula, and those interests deserve to be factored into the equation as American or South Korean or Japanese policymakers uh, examine their own options. Uh, without a doubt, the reaction in Jeonanhai to the abrupt news that President Trump had uh, announced his intent to hold a summit was a mix of relief that we were looking uh, at a summit instead of a bloody nose, um, but horror and concern at the lack of coordination and the risk that China and its interests would be somehow marginalized or, or sidelined. But there is no peaceful solution to the threat posed by North Korea that doesn't involve real U.S.-China cooperation. The uh, failure of the U.S. to consult with China or other partners in advance of an announcement of a decision to hold a summit, the failure of China to do likewise, doesn't augur well for our ability to uh, push and nudge uh, and pressure North Korea towards the kind of complete and verifiable denuclearization that we are both aiming for. Um, we really need to present a unified front, and what we should worry about at this juncture is a recurrence of the bad model of three against three, where China and Russia line up behind North Korea uh, in opposition to the US, the ROK, and Japan. That's not a recipe for stability in Northeast Asia. Jung saying, China, yes. bottom lines. Yes. Actually, uh, this, has, this is uh, related to how China sees North Korea. Uh, whether this is, uh, North Korea will be a strategic uh, asset or strategic liability. They are saying that uh, their position is threefold, as, as, as was mentioned in this uh, Shinhanya statement. Uh, they are now, more than ever, uh, tending to emphasize the need for uh, denuclearization because any nuclear test in North Korea will affect uh, Northeastern China as well. But they, still, they are still very cautious about pushing North Korea too far because if that becomes the case, that could lead to the collapse of the North Korean regime. So still, I think uh, they will not press North Korea to that point. But uh, well, our worry, our concern is that uh, unless we are united, as Danny mentioned, among five parties, to press North Korea uh, to feel the pains emanating from their illegal possession of nuclear weapons, North Korea has no incentive to give up nuclear weapons. So this is why uh, the role of the role of China is very, much, very, very important at this point. They should continue to play a constructive role with U.S., with South Korea. Otherwise, uh, this Northeast Asia uh, will start unwanted, unfortunate development, that is, nuclear arms race involving new actors, even some nuclear rearmament. As you know already, some countries have a big potential for that. And uh, uh, a very famous American uh, the, uh, scholar are now saying that uh, we are starting a uh, new post-Cold War, a second 
cold, uh, new, second nuclear age in the post-Cold War era. That means already we have two de facto nuclear weapon states, one nuclear weapon state, maybe one country, North Korea, who is aiming at another nuclear weapon state, then if this ignites arms race, nuclear arms race, there'll be one or two more. So I think we have to prevent this uh, from becoming a reality. So this is the importance of these ongoing talks. I think um, my um, managing director of the Asia Society of Policy Institute, Deborah Eisenman, is giving me dirty looks now for 15 minutes because uh, I was supposed to turn to Q&A um, 15 minutes ago, but I haven't um, because I wanted to provide people the opportunity to hear from our, our two guests. Um, so um, I'm looking at you, Josette. Can we go through to 225 rather than 215 or not? <laughs> Josette's looking zen. Uh, Deborah, is, uh, 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 Deborah is not zen. The, um, as we quickly flip then to the United States, that'll leave time for two or three questions from the audience. Um, I have this um, uh, concern, I suppose, or reflection that the bottom line Chinese position on North Korea may be uh, if a deal on um, denuclearization occurs, it would be some sort of arrangement which saw a freeze imposed on the further development of North Korea's ICMB, Intercontinental Ballistic Missile Capability, that is, that which threatens the United States uh, mainland, while effectively accepting the continued reality of uh, North Korean short to medium range missiles and the nuclear capabilities which go along with that. From a Chinese perspective, that would not be ideal. Uh, it still runs the risk of proliferation consequences in South Korea and with Japan as they would seek to respond to that threat. But it would also create enormous tensions between the Republic of Korea and the United States on the one hand, and between Japan and the United States on the other. But I'll just leave that parked there as a thought. Uh, finally, before we just go to a brief period of Q&A, the United States of America, Uncle Sam. So you're sitting in the White House, Danny Russell, where you've sat for some time in the West Wing, um, and um, you've now seen the Chinese diplomatic play over the weekend. Uh, with Kim Jong-un taking the long train ride to Beijing um, uh, with food tasters intact um, in both directions. Uh, how do you think the United States could and should play this negotiation now? Well, Kevin, I think um, sanctions are a little bit like penicillin, and it is dangerous to end the regimen prematurely because the problem just comes roaring back uh, in uh, exacerbated form. So one thing that is very important, as uh, Foreign Minister Yun uh, stressed, is the importance of maintaining the positive pressure of withholding and denying North Korea uh, the rewards for its bad behavior and the wherewithal to, uh, to fund uh, continued confrontation and so on. But at the same time, uh, we can't be uh, blind to the possibility that the, uh, the pressure of sanctions, uh, particularly those applied by China, uh, have, Kim, have brought Kim Jong-un to a point where he feels forced to consider uh, options that he had consistently rejected thus far. Uh, so setting the stage for a uh, serious diplomatic uh, negotiation, a real process, is the challenge that lies before us. Uh, no president in the United States uh, thus far had considered it prudent to begin a process with the DPRK at leader level. It really doesn't leave you very many places to go except down uh, if it doesn't work. I think were there to be a successful uh, summit, quote unquote, successful, uh, it's likely to be one that brought us back, in effect, to square one, where the, uh, the experts and the negotiators were empowered to sit down with the DPRK counterparts and hopefully in consultation with uh, partners in South Korea and, and, and China uh, to begin the difficult 
uh, effort that has been uh, attempted now, as uh, Farm Ms. Yoon said, four times, uh, to uh, navigate a series of uh, trade-offs and gives and takes that gradually move the DPRK from a freeze to a monitored freeze to a rollback to ultimately a dismantlement of its nuclear missile program. Foreign Minister, if I could hear your thoughts briefly before I turn to the audience. Right. Actually, when I read this Sinan uh, statement, uh, uh, one thing draws my attention. That is, for the first time in recent uh, two weeks, uh, Kim Jong-un, uh, with his own voice, confirmed the fact that he is now, his, he and his regime is now uh, ready to engage in talks, summit talks with the United States for the first time. Because so far, there, there was a silence on this matter. So that's good. And uh, then regarding uh, U.S. position, uh, I really wish President Trump uh, to maintain his uh, principled position. Uh, that is, he will be different from previous American leaders. He will redress the defects and problems they suffered in the past. Uh, so uh, for that to happen, he should not be tempted to uh, have political trophy because this year uh, there will be a, a by-election in the United States. In Korea, we have a, a province election in June. So we have to focus on this matter as a merit, not for political scoring, point scoring. So otherwise, as uh, Kevin said, uh, in case he agrees on some half-baked measure like decoupling, having uh, assurance from Kim Jong-un on the, the suspension of uh, ICBM launch for the development of ICBM launch, instead of uh, having maintaining this uh, capability for nuclear uh, short-range short and medium-range missiles, intermediate-range missile, then that will be the nightmarish scenario for Seoul and Tokyo. And uh, freeze-only, uh, uh, freeze-based approach is not the answer. Uh, that's the, the objective is the CVID and uh, moratorium is not sufficient. You know, that can be done anytime, a very easy one. So uh, we should not forget uh, those, the, the previous lessons. We've got time for two quick questions. Uh, who is busting to ask a question? Prince Tokyo Faisal, you're very quick. So this is going to be a zinger of a question, which you've been working on for the last hour. Your Royal Highness. Um, what about Russia? Uh, Russia is also uh, a player in this, and they have problems with the West now. Could they be, be going to use this as one way of getting gaining something from it? I might turn to uh, you, Foreign Minister, to answer that. Well, you know, for the uh, for the uh, uh, for many years in the past, there has been a very nice division of labor between Moscow and Beijing on the Middle East issues it would be Russia who will take initiative. Then China will support that stance. On this North Korea question, uh, China tends to, has tended to take the initiative, and uh, Moscow has been in support of Chinese stance. But these days, for, especially for the last two years, when China is more active on this implementation of the sanctions on North Korea, uh, North Korea was very un unhappy and very infuriated. infuriated. So they approached Russia uh, more than ever before, and Russia now wants to wants more voices in this North Korean question, and uh, they are already ready to provide uh, good advices uh, to North Korea on how to deal with the United States. But uh, our, 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 our demand, our, our, our suggestion is that uh, uh, Russia's role is very important, not just as a uh, uh, the potential as a member of the Security Council who can play a bit of rise, but also uh, because uh, actually without help of this all of our neighbors actually this uh, regional problem uh, cannot be resolved once and for all. Good. One question from down here. Uh, you've got the microphone over there. Good. Well done. Otherwise, we're going to throw you mine. Good. Uh, Dick Drobnik, Southern California Center. Uh, Foreign Minister Yun, I confess that I'm very skeptical that North Korea will give up nuclear weapons. Convince me that I'm wrong. What, what what do they need, in your mind, to really give them up? 
Uh, so far, I made some uh, long explanation, especially I belong to the previous conservative government. The policy I have pursued is a very, very uh, strong uh, campaign uh, to build an international uh, the front uh, to implement the sanctions on North Korea. Uh, because uh, without those uh, sanctions, North Korea will not give up. But even with those uh, strongest ever sanctions, uh, we, are very much the, uh, we are not very much optimistic about the possibility that North Korea will uh, give up nuclear weapons because already uh, this pursuit of nuclear weapons is enshrined in their constitution in 2012. Then the following year, they enacted a new separate law uh, to justify that. Then uh, in 2013, they started this uh, new principle, new uh, policy of uh, pursuing parallel approach. That means nuclear weapons development as well as economic development. Now, this has been characterized by Kim Jong-un as the crowning achievement. So how can they abandon these nuclear weapons? So the reason why they, uh, give, uh, they, uh, they offer uh, freeze or the uh, conditional de denuclearization uh, seems to be because uh, they have no real intention to give up uh, what they have already. Maybe if they can compromise in the coming weeks and months, uh, if uh, our American colleagues and others are very lucky, maybe uh, their, their bottom line uh, could be some kind of freeze or partial uh, denuclearization, but uh, uh, South Korea and uh, Japan and uh, many others in the internet community uh, will not uh, accept uh, that uh, partial deal. Danny, the question wasn't to you, but you've got 60 seconds. Uh, is there any hope on heaven or in hell uh, that the DPRK would give up its nuclear capability? Not willingly. But we have to raise the cost to North Korea and to the regime in uh, Pyongyang for possessing and for manufacturing, and certainly for uh, proliferating nuclear weapons uh, and ballistic missiles, raise the cost while also addressing what North Korea is using them for. North Korea is not in the nuclear war fighting business. Uh, nuclear weapons are a means to an end. Their economic ends, their political uh, leverage over South Korea, form of extortion, uh, to garner uh, economic benefits, to garner status. Now, if you were to give all of that to North Korea up front, uh, it would have its cake and eat it too. Uh, instead, to set a dynamic whereby North Korea can only obtain the economic and the political benefits that it seeks by gradually coming into compliance, that's the strategy that we should pursue. Well, today we've heard from Danny Russell, uh, master of the toggle. Uh, is this about... Uh uh, full forward on, on uh, escalation and now full reverse on de-escalation. A change in tactics, but not in strategy, but a maybe. Uh, is there a half a glimmer of light that we've still yet to fully perceive? And the analogies used by uh, the foreign minister were the mission now being one of uh, walking on very thin glass, which he said was far too generous an analogy. It's picking your way through a minefield and walking on glass at the same time. Uh, either way, it doesn't strike me as an easy way forward. Here's my concluding thought. What I worry about is where we get to if one round or the other round of summitry, the five that have been talked about, actually come to nothing. What I worry about is when Washington, under the current administration, concludes that, quote, we've tried diplomacy and it's failed, unquote particularly if the diplomacy is ill-prepared, because in a very simplistic view of the world, that then leaves one option remaining, which has the word military attached to it. So with that sobering thought, let me ask all of you to put your hands together to thank this extraordinary panel for their contribution. <laughs>